If you're thinking about moving to Portland in 2023, I'm going to cover some of the changes, all the things that you need to know, crime, the downtown, homelessness, taxes, housing, all the important stuff, all that starts now. All right, we're going to cover about half a dozen different topics here about what's going to be different in 2023. What should you know? especially if you're not familiar with Portland. Maybe you're coming from outside of the state. Maybe you've been here in the past but haven't been here recently. What's going to be different in 2023? Well, right here, uh, this article kind of gives you a little bit of the sentiment of the people. Portland at a crossroads on homelessness, crime, livability, annual business poll fines. Now, this was written just a couple weeks ago. I would say that uh, uh, I I think the sentiment, you know, I think we felt like we've been at a crossroads uh, for a little while. Um, so you can see right down here, a new poll of Portland area voters found that 78% of voters surveyed in December feel their quality of life is getting worse down from 88% down, if you can believe that, at 78%, down from 88% the previous year. So it feels like we're trending in the right direction, just kind of anecdotally driving around Portland, driving around the downtown. It does feel a little bit cleaner there. It does feel a little bit safer. You, you do still see uh, some of the boarded up windows, and we'll, we'll look at that uh, a little bit later in this video. But just driving around Portland, it does feel a little bit different than it did, say, like a year ago. But there's still going to be a lot of room for improvement. Here's some of the things that we're still seeing. So Portland's broken window epidemic. Who's behind the vandalism? What's going to stop it? There's more reports of broken windows and vandalism in Portland last year in 2022 than during the violent protests of 2020. Uh, I'm not sure what the number is, but a lot of windows were broken in 2020. That was kind of the thing to do. Kind of interesting, they're referring to it as violent protests as well. That sort of language uh, wasn't exactly allowed back in 2020. Every 42 minutes, there's a report of vandalism in Portland, often involving broken windows. Some storefronts have been hit repeatedly. We've seen it a lot, says landlord Matt Kaplan, as a repair crew worked to replace broken glass outside of his old town building. It was the fifth time in three years vandals had smashed the windows. So we do see that in Portland a lot, and for some reason, we're still seeing it, and uh, there's actually been a little bit of an uptick, apparently, in broken windows. Now, some other things that we're still seeing, still seeing a lot of theft. Nike temporarily closes a celebrated Portland store because of ongoing theft. Now, if you've uh, lived in or spent a lot of time around the Portland metropolitan area and you wear any sort of athletic clothing, you've probably been to the Nike factory outlet store at some point in the past. It's been there uh, for as long as I can remember since I was a kid. Nike has at least temporarily closed its first ever factory store because of theft. The store has been point of pride for Nike in the Northeast Portland community since it opened. If you're not familiar, Nike uh, is from Portland. Founders originally from Portland. The company was founded in Portland. Nike is working with Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler uh, to, on a proposal to reopen the store. Seen that from Starbucks as well. There's a Starbucks downtown Portland that recently closed up. Apple store was boarded up for a long time. So some of the bigger stores closing up, boarding up, moving along. So we're still kind of seeing some of that stuff in Portland, despite some of the efforts to, uh, to fix some of these problems. This article actually from a couple days ago when I was doing a Google search before I made this video coming up from the LA Times. So I thought that was kind of interesting. What's the matter with Portland? Shooting theft and other crime. Test the city's progressive strain. Look at this picture right here. Pretty incredible picture. Uh, this is over on the east side. So what you're looking at over here is on the west side. So the downtown is kind of just north of here, up, uh, this way. So something uh, from Portland resident uh, Flora Gonzalez, who lives on the northeast side of the street, distressed about conditions in the historically blue-collar neighborhood. 40-year-old package handler from FedEx said that people have openly dealt drugs, urinated on the sidewalk outside her family's duplex. They've dumped feces and used syringes in her manicured yard, played booming music at 3 a.m., stripped cars, stolen, stripped stolen cars for parts. Shots have been fired behind her children's bedroom. We feel abandoned, Gonzalez says. We pay our taxes, and the police are not watching over our security. Uh, where she's describing uh, is in the, the east side of uh, Portland. But Juniper Simonis, who rents a home across the street, said she's opposed calls for police clampdowns. Three old environmental biologist, data scientist, whose front yard features a handmade, disarm to fund dismantled police sign, said Portland officials continue to fail the homeless by underfunding services and sweeping camps with callous disregard for people's dignity and property. So you can see there's still um, some conflicting interests in Portland. 
a lot of people calling for more police as Portland did take some of the police budget back in 2020 and reallocate that uh, to other places. A lot of police officers also quit. Uh, Portland, the Portland police in general, uh, has about, uh, per capita, about half of what like another major metropolitan city would have. So you've heard a lot of calls um, for more police, but then there are some people that uh, still want less police. So Portland long hailed as a model of conscientious urban planning and civic, civic engagement. Portland is facing a crisis of confidence nearly three years after the pandemic lockdowns emptied out the city's core, and it did feel really empty. If you went downtown Portland during the pandemic, it was a ghost town down there, with the exception of uh, people camping on the streets. Protests against police brutality turned a few downtown blocks into a battleground. The city, about 641,000, dealing with skyrocketing numbers of homeless people, soaring crime, strikingly high levels of public dissatisfaction with what the city is doing about it. For the last three years, the number of unhoused people in the metro area has jumped from 4,000 to at least 6,600. Shootings in the city have tripled. Homicides climbed from 36 in 2019 to 97 last year. So 2022 was a record number of homicides. The record before that was 2021. Hopefully that doesn't get broken again in 2023. More than 11,000 vehicles stolen in 2022, up from 6,500 in 2019. So almost twice as many vehicles stolen last year compared to three years ago. Fatal drug overdoses nearly doubled from 2019 to 2021. Polls conducted last year showed only 11% of voters thought Portland was headed in the right direction, a steep drop from 36% in 2020 and 76% in 2000. Yeah, around the year 2000, uh, which is around when I graduated high school, didn't really hear about these things. You didn't really hear too many complaints about Portland. You didn't hear, you know, Portland was um, maybe still known as a, a a left-leaning city, an activist city, but didn't really have that sort of political divisiveness, that political undertone, that feel that it has now, which a lot of the country uh, does have, to be fair, not just limited to Portland. So backlash underway in November, voters passed a measure to overhaul city government, ousted the city's most outspoken left-wing commissioner, who led a 2020 charge to cut police funds, but they're struggling to agree on how it can return to being a place many once viewed as a liberal utopia. So this picture right here is uh, really close to where that picture you would have seen it was uh, that we initially looked at with the American flag with the guy camped out right by the river. He was probably right down there somewhere. So this is the east side right here. It used to be just uh, vacant parking right here. And uh, these right here, if you're wondering what these are, these are our tiny homes. A handful of places you'll find that uh, throughout Multnomah County and then uh, sanctioned uh, camp spots. You don't see too too much of uh, these sort of like sanctioned areas for campers or tiny homes though, um, but there are uh, plans for more of those. We'll get to that here in just a moment. Shutdowns of 2020 ravaged downtown, hollowing out core sections of the city as businesses closed and offices shifted to remote work. We'll talk about remote work as well in just a moment. In the summer of 2020, Portland's city commissioners voted to cut the police budget by 15 million short of the 50 million sum demanded and uh, disbanded its gun violence reduction team, which critics had long accused of uh, disproportionately targeting young black men. It also invested in the Portland Street Re Response Program, which uh, dispatches unarmed paramedics and health workers to help people experiencing mental health and substance abuse crises. The next year, the city contended with a record number of shootings and homicides commissioners turned around and voted to increase the police budget. They also set up a new gun violence team with more oversight. But the violence continued uh, to escalate. Thousands moved away after decades of growth. City population dropped in 2021 by 1.7%. More specifically, that is Multnomah County. We'll get into that as well. The, the Portland metropolitan area is a tri-county area also made up of Clackamas and Washington County. So it's only Multnomah County that's experienced uh, that population decline. The other two um, have experienced growth. Portland still has many of its charms, towering firs, giant sequoias, efficient light rail and bike lanes, microbreweries, craft markets, and views of snow-capped Mount Hood, but the downtown, some buildings remain boarded up. And again, this, this is a recent article. Definitely fewer buildings that are boarded up downtown, but uh, you still see some of it. So you see, you do still see some of this. This picture was taken in 2021, but uh, you're still gonna find a fair amount of that downtown. You know, th this is uh, kind of what went on for uh, about a year. Um, 
I don't know where you live, but uh, you might have heard of you know protests going on for a few weeks, a month, maybe a few months in Portland. It uh, this kind of stuff went on for a good solid year. So how did that uh, how did that make some people uh, feel? You know, there's been a lot of articles written on this, but here's one of the most recent ones, and this was just somebody responding to an article why I left uh, Portland. Heard a lot of stories like this. My family was born and raised in the Portland area for several generations. I owned a business, a rental property, and a house in Portland. I sold everything in Portland over the last two or three years. It simply broke my heart to have to leave. We moved just outside of Sandy. Sandy is in Clackamas County. Uh, it's uh, maybe 40, 45 minutes um, up to an hour uh, just east of Portland towards Mount Hood. In hindsight, it was the best decision I ever made. I do miss the old Portland, except the traffic, of course. But on my occasional visits to downtown for a blazer game, we all go down downtown for a blazer game at some point, dinner or show, I'm glad I didn't live in the middle of the chaos. I still root for my old city. I was happy to see life starting to creep back downtown two weeks ago near the Crystal Ballroom. Ultimately, it looks like there's a lot of work left to be done. Stumptown returns to her old glory. Here's to a brighter future. I just hope I live long enough to see that. So I think that kind of really encapsulate, encapsulates a lot of sentiment from, from people that left Portland kind of fed up, uh, still optimistic about the future. Like I said, it does feel like things are trending in the right direction, but not going to happen overnight. You know, this is not a genie that uh, we're just going to be able to put back in the bottle. So Portland moves forward with a 27 million plan to build mass shelters and ban street camping. So this happened at the end of 2022, which was kind of striking because uh, straight from the mayor's mouth, Ted Wheeler, he said uh, back in 2020, we're not going to ban camping. We're not going to tell people that they can't camp where they want in Portland. There was reasons for that, obviously. In fact, uh, Multnomah County contributed to that. They were the ones that handing out to tents to people, uh, but we found out that didn't exactly work too well. So some key details of the plan remain unknown, including where the city will build mass campsites that would shelter up to 250 people. Well, here is one place uh, as of uh, just a couple of days ago that uh, they are eyeing between 13th and 16th Avenue over on Powell. So this is in East Portland, more of a commercial area. Officials in Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler's office appear to have selected a sparsely populated stretch of the city's central east side sandwich between the Brooklyn and Hosford Abernathy neighborhoods as likely as a likely site for a large tent encampment. Now, aside from the city doing things to fix this, um, again, the county uh, has been trying to help. Multnomah County has a plan to move hundreds off of Portland streets and into apartments. Again, Multnomah County was the one that was handing out tents. The city of Portland is the one sweeping those tents. So the city and county not exactly working uh, efficiently there together. That's something that hopefully they can improve as we work to get people off the streets and get people help. So overall, the sentiment in Portland is people are sort of fed up. Our leaders are finally taking steps to do something. Obviously don't have all the answers yet and not everybody agrees. Not everybody thinks that we need more police as we saw in the article from the LA Times. I think the general feeling is it's time to take action enough of allowing for these things like urban camping uh, that really isn't a solution for anybody, including the campers themselves. All right, the next thing, one thing you want to know about uh, working or living in Portland, Oregon in 2023. Portland, Oregon is ranked number six in the United States by major cities uh, for remote work. Now, this may be sort of tied into uh, some of the problems, actually, uh, that downtown had. A lot of people speculated that uh, because there were fewer people downtown, the people committing crimes sort of felt m maybe more emboldened or they, they felt like they could get away with it more. So the downtown, again, was kind of a ghost town at times and having a lot of remote workers contributed to that. So the businesses downtown, like the restaurants and all those food carts that Portland is known for, really struggled because they didn't have the traffic that they used to have with remote workers. So kind of a double-edged sword. A lot of people prefer to work remotely, but that does make it difficult for the brick and mortar businesses that rely on people going downtown to work, such as the restaurants. But I mentioned this because if you are somebody that's interested in remote work or more specifically, uh, something that we're seeing more commonly, the hybrid. So, so maybe going into the office two or three days a week and working from home two or three days a week, you're gonna be able to find a lot of jobs in Portland that are going to accommodate that. So if you want to be in a city that is going to be remote worker friendly or like I said, maybe hybrid friendly, Portland is going to be a great place to live. All right, the next thing you need to know, 
the tolls are coming to Portland. If you're from the East, you're probably familiar with tolls. I don't know of, or I haven't heard of anybody that really uh, thinks that this is the best solution uh, to support the funding, the purpose for these tolls, which one reason is this is this bridge right here. This is the Abernathy Bridge. Uh, this is I-205. This side over here is West Lynn. On the other side over here is Oregon City uh, and Gladstone. And they're adding a lane to each side of uh, this bridge as well as improving the bridge uh, to bring it up to current uh, standards uh, for surviving or um, withstanding an earthquake. So ODOT, Oregon Department of Transportation, needs funds for this. They decided tolling was the best way to do it. Let me show you where that's going to be. Again, that is the Abernathy Bridge, West Lynn to Oregon City right here. So we're going to have a toll right here. And then there's also going to be a toll right here, this little bridge right here that crosses the Tualatin River. So this is I-205 right here. These are the two tolling spots right here. If you're from the West Coast, you are familiar, of course, with I-5. It goes from California, well, it goes from Mexico uh, to Canada. And as you can see, I-5 right here, I-205 splinters off from I-5 and then meets back up with I-5 here in Washington. And with the way Portland uh, is laid out, a lot of jobs over here. Here's the downtown. Here's the east side over here. There's not a lot drawing people over here. So there's not a ton, there's, there's not a ton of congestion over here. You know, don't get me wrong for the, all the people that live around this area. You, you know, I, I know there's traffic over there, of course, but it's not like um, 217 over here or one of the most congested areas when you're crossing over from Washington, Oregon, the I-5 bridge right here. It's not super congested over here. So, so for the people that are living around here and have to commute, definitely not one of the worst parts of Portland. One way that this is going to impact the entire Portland metropolitan area, a lot of commercial drivers, a lot of truck drivers that are taking the I-5, Washington to Oregon to California, vice versa, California, Oregon to Washington, up and down the I-5. Oftentimes they are actually taking 205 off of the I-5 and then meeting back up again to I-5 right here. Now I know it looks like, and it probably is because it's not, not a straight shot, not as the crow flies, right? It's probably quite a few more miles to take I-205 than it is I-5 right here, but the traffic on I-5 is so much worse that truck drivers are taking this route oftentimes to avoid the congestion. And if you map it with traffic, oftentimes, even though 205 is maybe a little bit longer, it actually doesn't take longer if you're taking 205 off the I-5 because the traffic is so bad. So one thing that we possibly anticipate is that if truckers are going to now avoid these tolls, they might go back to taking the I-5 again, and I-5 is going to get even worse. Now, there are talks of adding additional tolls, uh, including onto I-5, so that, may tip, that might tip the, the scales back to the balance, you know, to where, where they were um, with truckers taking I-205, but as it stands, we're probably going to expect actually more congestion around I-5 because of these tolls. And then the biggest complaint is for people that live immediately in these areas where the tolls are because they think kind of the more the local community commuters are going to hop off of the 205 and drive through Westland and Oregon City. And it's going to increase congestion uh, on your city streets here and through your neighborhoods, which it, it very well may. Now, there's been talks of uh, the tolls being sunsetted and, or some sort of safeguard so that these tolls don't run. And definitely nobody really, uh, I, I don't think, believes that's going to happen. So I think once we see tolls come, they're probably never going to go away. It's just going to be a matter of uh, how many we have and, and where they're at. So to recap, tolls in 2023, I think you're going to find some more congestion along I-5. Maybe a little less congestion along 205. So nice for people taking the 205. You're going to pay for it now. Maybe a little bit more congestion in these cities with people trying to skip these tolls. All right, now let's talk about the housing market. But before we get into it, if you're new to this channel, living in Oregon, and you'd like to know more about what it's like to live in Oregon, you're thinking about moving to Oregon, you want to see more videos like this about what it's like to live in Oregon, what the housing market is like, make sure and hit the subscribe button and tap the bell. That way you'll be notified every time we drop a new video, which is every week. And if you're somebody that's thinking about taking the next steps as licensed real estate brokers in the state of Oregon, as much as we love making these videos, we'd love to help you move here. So if you're somebody that wants to talk about moving to Portland, moving somewhere in Oregon, you can call us, text us, email us, or click the link below in the description if you want to hop into our calendar and schedule a Zoom call with us. All right, so how is the real estate market right now? So something that jumps out real quick, 
January 2021, 2022, 2023. This is inventory in months. So what does this mean? This means that uh, 2.7, it would take 2.7 months on average if no new listings came to the market to sell all of the current inventory. You can see that's up from 0 0.8, 2022, 1.0 in 2021 so a lot more inventory here in 2023 that's the first thing that really jumps out but new listings decreased 16 percent in 2023 from 2022 so more inventory listings decreasing what gives so what's why is that the days on market uh, for the current listings are much much higher so the stuff that got listed over the past few months has been sitting for much much longer sales are way down so this inventory this 2.7 months worth of inventory is mostly not new listings pending sales decreased 22 percent from offers accepted in january 22 uh, to offers accepted in december closed sales decreased 41 percent from January 2022 to December of 2022. So almost about half amount, the amount of sales uh, from the previous year. Total market time increased to 65 days. When the market was really red hot during the pandemic, total days on market on average was somewhere around 20 or so. 60 days is closer to a balanced, uh, balanced market, maybe not necessarily seller's market or a buyer's market. What we saw Q3, Q4 of 2022 was closer to like 40 days on market. So this is the highest we've seen in a long time. And again, that's the reason for all the inventory right now. We're comparing the first month 2023 to the same period 2022, new listings decreased 16% as mentioned above. Average sale price down about 9.2% from the previous year as well too. Now that's gonna get a little bit tricky uh, because anecdotally as realtors, what are we seeing? Well, you shopping online at Zillow, you're probably seeing a lot of price drops. We've seen a lot of that in the last six, seven, eight months. Didn't see any of that before the, the previous six, seven, eight months, right? But as realtors, we're still seeing a lot of competition specifically right here, 300 to 600,000, about that 500, 600,000 homes in that price range are still going under contract very quickly. They're still getting multiple offer offers, so it's still very competitive. And, and if you're shopping on Zillow at Redfin, Realtor.com, Trulia, you probably notice that as well. Some of those favorites that you save, you probably notice that uh, they're going under contract, going pending in two, three, four days. So the really desirable stuff is still moving quickly. A lot of other stuff is still sitting for a long time. So is it a buyer's market? Is it a seller's market? It really depends on just the neighborhood and the property right now. Some some places, some property is going to be seller's market. Some is going to be a buyer's market. I'm going to scroll down here real quick before we move on to the next uh, numbers here. Something I found interesting, uh, Clark County is across the river in, in uh, Washington. That's where Vancouver, Washington is. So this is kind of comparing the Vancouver area to the Portland metropolitan area. Portland being orange, you can see in the past... Portland median sales price always been higher than Vancouver. I mean, it, it makes sense. Uh, real estate is more valuable in the uh, Portland uh, as opposed to across the river in Vancouver, except right here you can see Clark County actually surpassed uh, the Portland metropolitan area. Now the Portland metropolitan area, Tri-County area made up of Multnomah, Clackamas, and Washington County. I'm gonna show you some numbers here from Zillow. A lot of people that call us are always looking at Zillow. They put a lot of faith in Zillow. You know, it's uh, as far as estimates go and Zillow's data, Zillow has a lot of data, obviously, and uh, a lot of their estimates are do tend to actually be very, very accurate. Uh, they can also oftentimes be very inaccurate. Just me personally following my home value from Zillow compared to Redfin. Uh, I don't want to put a number on it, but a percentage of uh, the difference between Zillow and Redfin, how, how much it's skewed over the past couple of years has probably been somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20%. So at one point, Zillow was saying my house was worth way more than Redfin does. And then at another point, Redfin was saying my house was way more, worth more than uh, Zillow does. So it's always kind of funny when we as realtors talk to you as a customer, depending on what you're looking at, Zillow, truly a Redfin. Uh, those estimates, those home value estimates uh, can really tend to vary. But if you're looking at an aggregate, if you're looking at a, you know, hundreds of homes, thousands of homes, the, the, the data is going to tend to be a little bit more accurate. So Zillow, when you look at numbers like this for an entire county, that's probably going to be fairly accurate. And Zillow predicting that Multnomah County, this is where Portland is, Portland proper, downtown Portland and the east side of Portland, going to go down a little bit over the next year. Clackamas County predicted to go up a little bit. 
as well as Washington County also predicted to go up a little bit. So why is that? Well, people are actually leaving Multnomah County and the places they're most commonly going are Washington and Clackamas County. I mentioned that because if you're considering resale value, if that's really important to you, maybe you're not gonna live somewhere for a long time. Maybe you've got a contract with a job just for a couple years and you know you're gonna sell your house uh, somewhere in the near future and the resale value is really at the top of your list, then you might consider Washington County or Clackamas County as opposed to Multnomah County. All right, so that takes us into more people moving out of Portland than moving in data shows. Analysis by the Portland Business Journal found the population of the metro area rose just 0.1% between 2020 and 2021. New data confirms what some Portlanders already knew. The Rose City doesn't seem to have the kind of draw that it once did, with fewer people moving in and as many or more moving out. Journal's analysis data from the IRS showed that most people who left Multnomah County between 2019 and 2020 went to Clackamas County, then Washington County, and then thirdly across the river to Clark County. Again, that's Vancouver over in Washington. Uh, followed by that, many high earners went to Deschutes County. That's central Oregon. That is where Bend is. Numbers also show many people left Multnomah County for California, Arizona, and Texas. Uh, which is very interesting because those are probably the top three states that we get calls from. So uh, the grass is greener on the other side, as they say. During that time, Multnomah County lost nearly 2,000 tax filers. Those moving out tended to make more money than the newcomers. So a lot of people leaving Multnomah County, higher earners leaving Multnomah County. So uh, Multnomah County needing financing to fix all of their problems. So what do you think is gonna happen? Beginning January, 2022, employers with Multnomah County location are required to withhold this tax from employees that work within Multnomah County and earn 200,000 or more in a calendar year. I believe that uh, is joint. Um, it's 125,000 for individuals. And uh, that rate will increase by 0.8% in 2026. So for you higher income earners, going to be looking at an additional ca uh, tax specifically and only for Multnomah County. All right, and then finally, last thing we have here, something looking up. Portland International Airport Project looking up. If you've never been a PDX before, it is one of the top airports in the country. Great airport for sure. Take a look at this new roof right here uh, that they just put in uh, last year. 2023 is going to be focused around the interior of the PDX. With the completion of the roof on track, the end of the year, 2023 will be spent working on the inside of the building, open air and active construction, replace the area where Powell's Books and the food court used to be as the main terminal, terminal is extended 150 feet. One thing to know about uh, PDX, one question here, what happened to the post security hallway? The old post security hallway connecting concourses A, B, and C with D and E now make up half of the two temporary hallways that bypass the construction. So I bring this up because if you're gonna be traveling, gonna be flying to PDX, you might want to account for that construction. In 2023, you might wanna to get to the airport uh, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes early. Now, I haven't been there to see uh, what, the what this looks like that they're referring to right here, but a little trick for you. If you're not familiar with PDX, when you go to security, there's two different directions you can go. You can go to left, A, B, and C gates or you can go to the right, D and E gates. Now, if you're going through, let's say your gate is B, and you see that A, B, and C all have really, really long security lines, and you happen to see that D and E don't have a very long security line, you can go through another gate, you can go through D and E security, and then there's this hallway that connects the two gates past security on the backside. It's probably about a five, six minute walk. So if you ever see security on one side or the other, that looks like it's probably gonna take you more than five or six minutes, just go to the opposite side and take that hallway and walk the other way to your gate. And we're all excited to see what uh, PDX looks like. PDX, uh, really kind of known for their quirky floor. A lot of people, the thing to do is to take a picture of your feet with this floor. If you're from Portland, you know what I'm talking about. Um, if you haven't seen that, probably sounds weird, but uh, you can find you know, probably no shortage of pictures like that on Instagram. So we're all excited to, to see what the uh, final result is for PDX. So I hope that uh, gives you a better feel for what things are gonna look like in 2023, maybe some things to account for that are gonna be new in 2023. And if you're thinking about taking the next steps and moving to Portland as brokers, we'd love to help you. You can call, text, email. And if this video helped you, 
give us a thumbs up, lets us know we're doing a good job. Feel free to leave a comment. And if you wanna see more videos like this about what it's like to live in Portland, about what the lifestyle is like in Portland, make sure and hit that subscribe button. Until next time, take care everyone.